Uh, I'm actually very new to the community family. This is about a month and a half in for me. And I'm the new <laughs> director of training and education, so I'm very excited to be here. And I'm looking forward to getting to know all of you over the years um, and working with you and, and getting a lot of good feedback. And I want to just thank you for coming and listening so intently to Ms. Karen Gale. Um, and also thank my team here in New York and Jessica especially for all the hard work it takes to put on this event. I wanted to also introduce our uh, special guest tonight. This is our chairman, president, and CEO, Mr. Vern Nagel. And he's just going to kick it off with a few words. Thank you. Thank you so much. Opportunity to have martinis and also get some learning credits in too, right? It's a, it's a winning combination. Yeah. Uh, I too, on behalf of the 7,000 associates at Acuity, would like to welcome you here. Uh, our office here is uh, really uh, quite an, uh, an interesting opportunity for us. The good news is, is that we're going to have to expand it because we keep growing. And we keep growing because of the support of the uh, specification community and folks like yourselves. So again, on behalf of all of our associates, thank you very much. As I think about our industry and I think about where we are and where we're going, it is just so fascinating to see how technology is allowing us to do so much more for so many more people. You're going to hear from Karen how Acuity's focus on the healthcare market, that particular vertical, is, is really changing uh, that industry. And we have the opportunity to change many more. Uh, today, we calling on a few customers in the marketplace to really talk to them about how digital lighting can really act as an in-store uh, location system. So if you start to imagine how that LED luminaire up there connected to your phone, and we just announced that we acquired some technology in a company called Lightlight, allows us to do so much more in terms of that visual light communication and really an internal GPS system. So when you think about healthcare, and these huge campuses, how if your phone can now connect you and guide you around the facility, it can help facilitate how folks operate in those facilities in a more efficient way. And this is lighting. This is not, it's quality of light, but it's also now allowing us to take advantage of the digital world uh, that we're all in. So I want to thank you for what you do for us and, and the support that you provide to us. Acuity is growing very rapidly because of that. Uh, through the first half of our fiscal year, we've grown at about a 15% clip. That's more than double the growth rate of the market. And again, it's because of support from folks like yourselves. But we're also investing very heavily in our business. In the last probably 60 days, we've added about almost 100 folks to our organization, different types of people with different skill sets than what we've had in the past because the industry is moving so quickly and because we're able to bring more and more value to folks like yourselves. It's the voice of you coming back to us saying, can you help us do these things? And Acuity is deeply committed uh, to the specification community here in New York and really around the globe. So again, enjoy Karen's presentation. She is the best of the best and I'm certain that you'll enjoy that. Again, thank you so much for uh, being here and thank you for your support. Again, for Thursday nights, martinis and lights. Um, those, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Jessica Lloyd. I'm training and education manager here at the Center for Light and Space in New York City. I have the honor of presenting the wonderful Karen Gale tonight. Um, Karen Gale is the vice president of the healthcare market for Acuity Brands Lighting. She's been in the industry for over 15 years and has been keenly focused on improving and understanding um, the visual experience in the healthcare sector. Um, Karen has an MBA from Georgia State in International Business, and she's going to kill me for doing this. What we're going to do is a special welcome for Karen because her birthday was yesterday. Let's welcome Karen by saying, Happy birthday, Karen. Ready? One, two, three. Happy birthday! for the kind words. It's always good when your CEO says something nice about you. Um, and thanks for the birthday wishes. Nobody's sitting up here. What's going on? Ever since that HR incident that one time, I don't slap people like me. <laughs> come on you over here. It. You heard about that? You know what? I Yeah, yeah. I, I do have a reputation that way. But we are going to talk. Um, let's make this very um, 
interactive. It's uh, martinis and light. It's not martinis and ISO foot candle plots, although that would be awesome because the martinis is there. Um, but what I'd like to do is maybe talk a little bit more conceptual, right? So, so Vern mentioned that, that my focus, my obsession, okay, that's a code word, is, is healthcare. Um, and so I'll certainly talk about healthcare and what's changing with healthcare and how that's going to evolve. Um, but I think more broadly, whether it's healthcare or education or at somebody's house, we're all interested in how we can create more restorative spaces, how we can use evidence to do better design. And so that's really going to be more of the focus. A little bit of engineers in the room. Anybody that's an engineer in the room? I'm going to use the word sparkle. <gasps> it's going to be all right. You can handle it, right? You can handle it. I may give you a warning. I may just drop it in there. Don't black out and have another drink. It'll be fine. Um, <laughs> But we're really thinking holistically, so there's some fluffy stuff in here, but that's okay, I'm okay, I can own that. Um, so, so a couple of different things, learning objectives, we want to talk about trends in the space, what's changing in the space, what's changing in healthcare. Uh, everything is changing in healthcare, and everything is changing in lighting, and I think the sweet spot is the convergence of the two, so let's explore that together. We're going to talk about the functional, uh, physiological, psychological needs, right? We're going to talk about emotions. It's not going to be Oprah. Right? You know? I don't know. Oprah was, hey, it was a good show. Uh, you know, the, those of you that do a lot of, you know, industrial or manufacturing lighting, you know, what, how does the forklift driver feel, you know, about his lights? We don't usually talk about that. Maybe we should. But in healthcare, we spend a lot of time on it because we realize that the healing response is holistic. It's not just one part of the human. Let's think about the, the full picture. Um, we're going to talk about some key design interventions, what people have done in different facilities, what the evidence has told us, um, and then we're going to talk about the future, right? So what's going to happen? How, how is that going to evolve? So, all right, so three, three big things that, um, just to kind of talk about trends. Changing care models, so what's happening with healthcare in this space, uh, evidence-based design, we'll talk a little bit about that, and then demographic shifts. Okay, but we gotta start with like a premise first, right? So let, let's see if you guys are with me. Let's see how many drinks you all have. It's gonna be really, it's covert. So first things first, so let's see if you agree. Uh, health and healthcare, not, not the same thing, right? Unfortunately. Resistance is futile, I'm just kidding. <laughs> right, so, so, so health and healthcare, not necessarily the same thing. Okay, let me tell you, what about this one? Healthcare and sick care. Ish. 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 Ish, right? But it's changing. But it's changing. And so I guess when we think about healthcare, I mean, how many people in the in this room specialize in, in healthcare design? This one guy, right? So me and this guy. <laughs> <laughs> and, 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 and is this your first proverbial rodeo? Have you been doing healthcare design for a while? Because it's only you and me talking. I don't know. The rest of these guys, they just came for the drinks. I used to. You used to. <laughs> because now all my hospitals are closing. Okay. Well, don't bring everybody down. But yes. <laughs> so, 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 so the interesting thing is a lot of times when we think about healthcare design, it leaves us in a, it, it puts us in a certain path, right? But one of the questions that I have been wrestling with lately is if we decouple the term, if we think about healthcare, we think about designing for health and then design for the things that make sense in today's care facility, do we come up with better alternatives? Does that <laughs> decoupling it really uh, create an opportunity for innovation? So I'm asking the question, we'll see if we can, we can answer it. But first, more depressing stats. It's healthcare, you're gonna be a little bit, bit depressed. That's all right. So, United States, I know I've got some Canadians in the back. My Canadians, this bump, okay, that's great. I'm not Canadian, I'm Jamaican, but I still, I, we have some solidarity. Okay. So, Commonwealth or something. Snow. Yes. Uh, yeah. Something. Right? I don't know. It's on Earth. So, so when you look at the states, costs are high in healthcare. We know sometimes it's not great to be first. That the United States spends more than anybody else on healthcare. That would be awesome, technical term, if we had the best care in the world. But we don't. We're right in the middle of the road. So, so this is really the catalyst for a lot of those policy changes that you see. Cost is super high, expect it to double, don't have the best care, something's got to give. And enter things like Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act, AKA Obamacare. So, one of the big things that you see with the policy changes, so Affordable Care Act, is this shift from volume to value. If you focus on the healthcare sector and you got a dollar for every time somebody talks about volume to value, you wouldn't have to work anymore. It's, it, it's a thing. 
But, but really what it's driving is this movement of the healthcare industry into the regular commercial world in a way, right? So if I came in, who, who likes, who shops at Target or Target? Anybody? This one? Okay, see? Now, all right, good. Now, now we're a tribe. So if you went to, tell me your name? Rod. Rod. So if Rod went to Target or Target and had a bad experience, what would you do? Oh, okay. So <laughs> that's what I expected you to say. But yes, you would go somewhere else, right? Because competition exists. But you'd also tell your friends, you'd go, like, ah, I'll go to Target, it's bad there, the grapes are shriveled, or something bad happened to you there. You would tell people, you would tweet about it, and Target would fix their ways because they care about you as a consumer. When you think about the healthcare world, man, right? Horror stories, if you think about the worst example you've ever heard, right? Sit in the waiting room, be glad we saw you today and not next week. It's changing. It's this idea that we matter, consumers matter, patients matter, patient experience matters. And if you really dig deep enough and you use this follow the money approach, which always works, there are a number of different things that are driving that. Hospitals always care about people, right? That's sort of what they do. But what's happening is in the States, Medicare and Medicaid drives a lot of the reimbursements. So for an acute care hospital, for example, patient experience is becoming more relevant. In fact, if their patient experience scores, called HCAPS, which is a very complicated acronym, stands for Hospital Consumer Assessment of Healthcare Providers and Systems, it's a patient perception survey. If those scores don't improve over time, or relative to their peers, they can miss out on up to 2% of their top line revenues. That's who our CFO was around earlier. If we missed out on 2% of our top line revenues, somebody would be in trouble. You say, hmm, 2%, that's not much. What do you think the average operating profit margin for a hospital is? 10% 10, 10 would be generous. They would be dancing in the streets. It'd be like Mardi Gras in the healthcare world. Picture that for a moment. It's, it's between two and four. So the not-for-profit hospitals, the average is about 2.2%. For-profit uh, investor owned, it's about 4 to 5%. So that's huge. That's really huge, and that 2% on the top line when you've got those thin margins, it means even more. So patient experience matters, it's driving reimbursements. Okay, the other thing that matters uh, quite a lot, always has mattered, is outcomes, right? So you go to a hospital to get better, not to get sicker. So for example, secondary infections. For a long time, if you went and you got a hospital acquired infection, nosocomial infection, the hospital wouldn't get reimbursed for that. Another thing that's being driven now through Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act is they're cracking down, cracking down. They're reducing reimbursements for excess readmissions, right? So I go and, and I've had an episode of care and I have to go back because maybe something wasn't done right the first time. Could be chronic condition, but, but this is something else where, where hospitals are just gonna have to wrestle with and they are in the process of wrestling with how do we create more value as opposed to this fee-for-service model. So this is all changing, right? And I, it's in the contract somewhere as a lighting person I have to talk about energy. Um, hospitals in many communities are the, the largest energy consumers um, in, in, in many cases. DOE estimates, uh, estimates that lighting is about 40 to 42 percent of a typical hospital's electrical load. That number is not the same every single place, but typically what I see is high 20s into the 40s. Huge. Low hanging fruit, areas, areas to improve. Evidence-based design. We'll talk a lot about this. I'm, I'm not going to read these words. Essentially, it's this recognition that the built environment drives outcomes. If you take environmental stressors out of the built environment, you can improve outcomes. But we're going to see some examples about where people hypothesize, listen, could lighting do this, could, could whatever it is, and, and they saw an improvement in outcomes that matter. What are outcomes that matter to a healthcare facility? Nothing morbid. OK, fine. Length of stay. Right? Maybe length of stay, pain response, those types of things. We'll talk about that. In terms of evidence-based design, there are a lot of things that we know help improve outcomes in a space. What do you think the biggest environmental stressor for a typical healthcare facility is? Maybe think about a hospital. Isolation. Noise. Noise. I know, it's so direct noise. Absolutely. Absolutely. Privacy. And what did you say? Privacy. 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 Yes. I, I had a birthday yesterday. My best years are behind me. Now I can't hear. I can't see. It's <laughs> wait, sorry about just that. Wait. <laughs> just wait, right? Is it, is it more to come? Okay, great. All right. Awesome. Thanks for that. Can somebody bring me some uh, martini up here? 
So, so yeah, so noise. And we'll talk about how lighting can help influence that. So, again, wait, there's more. We're all getting older. Botox is going to be a thing. Facial expressions are overrated. <laughs> Okay? But we know that we've got this real aging of the population. Baby boomers, they, I mean, the baby boomers are en masse, right? Oldest baby boomers turned 65 in 2011. What's happening here is a demographic shift that's basically unprecedented, right? So what you're seeing is, if you look at this pie chart here, this dark apricot slice, that is a technical color, right? Dark apricot. So around now, it's people 65 and up are about... 13 to 15 percent of the population. What we're going to see in 15 years is people 65 and up are going to be 20 percent of the population and up. Um, that's massive. So when one out of five people um, in the population is 65 and up, you basically have to do things differently from a design perspective. The Canadians have it over the U.S. in terms of life expectancy. So give the Canadians the side eye on this, right? Just so you know. Because it's cold and it's frozen. Because it's cold. <laughs> that's the <laughs> problem. You take the last one. Don't the rest of it. Yeah, that's probably good. Why do, we, why, do we care, why do we care about old people like me in healthcare? Why do we care? Right? People 65 and up are about 50% of our hospital population. We're going to visit the phys a physician more times a year when we're 65 and up, seven times a year versus four times for, uh, for the younger population. Length of stay is longer. The reason that we care, so when you get to skilled nursing, certainly you're into the 80s. And the reason that matters to us as lighting people is that if I'm 20, again, we're pretending and making believe, if I'm 20, do I see the same as if I'm 70? No. No? You're shattering all my dreams? Okay, so changes with the eye happen with aging. Has anybody heard the rule of thumb that older adults need three to four times more light? Yes, it's true. Why, why is that the case? Because they're greedy? Okay, no. All right, so what happens is our pupils that kind of expand and contract based on available light, they, they, they're smaller and they stay more fixed. Also, um, our lenses, our crystalline lens, yellows over, over the course of time. It can be corrected with uh, corrective surgery, but that's really what happens. So, yes. And then we, there also uh, is, a, is a prevalence of, of eye diseases related to aging. So, so get excited. Grossest slide I have, like in my repertoire. Grossest slide ever. I'm going to tell you why it's gross. So I have to share it with you guys because I can't unsee it. Um, as we get older, our lens yellows. That blocks a certain portion of the spectrum. What I have on the left here is autopsy to lenses, okay? And this is um, the age of the person. Okay, so what you see is an infant going into a 91-year-old. Okay, so see, I told you. So yes, this happens. And and what what's the impact of this? When you look at so everybody everybody has this as their Instagram profile, spectral power distribution. Am I right? <laughs> Come on, lighting people, you don't care. Okay, right. I would like that photo. Okay. So, so essentially, if you look at um, this green is what the lumen is based on. It's V lambda. Lighting nerds love this. Um, but if you look at a 25-year-old, this is how much light in these different portions of the spectrum um, is being let in. So that magenta is 25. Look at it when you're 90. So a lot of that blue light is being blocked, right? And that of itself lets less light in, less um, of a certain type of light. We'll talk a little bit more about the impacts of that. Everybody grossed out, can we move on? We move on. Yes. These are more resources for lighting for low vision. So if we go back to our premise about uh, designing for health as well as care, don't we want to know, you know where to start? I would want to know where to start. So, so what makes it so unhealthy? And this, this isn't a set of judgment slides, I just want you to know that. Um, maybe it is a little bit. So, so chronic, chronic disease. This is something that I did not know. So more than three quarters of the money that the state spends on health care is due to chronic disease. 75% due to chronic disease, okay? If you are 65 and up, or you're entering the Medicare system, over uh, two thirds of, of, of uh, Medicare uh, beneficiaries have two plus chronic conditions. Lots of preventable behaviors are linked to, to, to chronic disease, not judging you. Um, but, but, but how can light help this? How can light fix this? So here's a quiz. Everybody wants it, but nobody's getting any. 
All right, New York, just keep it clean. Or, no, I don't, really care. I don't really care. No big deal. What do you think this is? Sleep. Who said that in the back? Somebody who's dozed. Somebody who's dozed. Are you telling me to do that? I'm sleep yes. deprived. Yes. Virtual, you know, chest bump in the back there. Okay. Exactly. This was me this morning. I woke up at 3:40 a.m. Not a morning person. Had to do it. Had a flight. Little um, bit of a tan, different hair, but this is me. Um, sleep is is massive. So let me ask. I would like to do a quiz. This is where the judgment comes in. So who who went to sleep last night? I'm looking to see who did not read. Mm, the party animals. Okay, so who slept? Who slept uh, five hours? Um, at least five hours last night. Okay, so keep your hands up if you slept uh, seven hours, at least. Who slept uh, eight and up? Eight hours. Who slept more? Who slept more than eight hours? <laughs> who is that? So there's always one. There's always like I like to call them the, the unicorn of the group. That like, yeah, like that, that has like glowing skin and is never sleep deprived and sleeps nine hours. They're catching up. I'm like, what is this? So you should move to the front. You should put a prize. This is massive. So essentially, what the CDC says, the CDC says that sleep deprivation is the epidemic of the 21st century. And if we don't sleep at least seven hours a night, we're sleep deprived. And if we don't sleep, I'm going to show you, and I'm going to depress you, bad things happen. But light can help with that. So two things that I'd like you to, so we should sleep every night. We should go to sleep every night. I know I just blew your mind here. There's two systems that at work. There's one that's called the sleep homeostasis. It's a very fancy way of saying we get tired. So we've got homeostatic sleep pressure. Sun is up. Very little sleep pressure. It builds, it builds, it builds, it builds. We get tired. This never happens during presentations, by the way. Okay. So, then we go to sleep, we sleep, the pressure dissipates. All right. Circadian alerting, that's the other system that's working with us, right? So the sun is up. When the sun is up, we, um, we're we diurnal mammals, we're day active, right? So it's go time. About an hour and a half before the sun sets, what happens is we get dim light melatonin onset. Everybody heard of melatonin? <coughs> Hormone of darkness for us because we're day active, it makes us feel sleepy. Hour and a half before bed-ish. We get dim light but melatonin onset, um, our body starts secreting melatonin, we go to sleep. So these systems actually work really elegantly together. And light is really that bio, it's that marker that's helping us say, okay, should I be awake or should I should I be asleep? Um, if we don't sleep, remember I said bad things happen. Creepy picture of a brain. Okay, so a couple of things that happen. When we sleep, when we get sufficient sleep, we have increased gray matter in our brains, and that's linked to good psychological health. This, anybody that, you know, thinks about like long-term care, older population, Alzheimer's, dementia, this second uh, study is really, really interesting. It's coming out of the <coughs> University of Rochester, and they're studying, they're trying to figure out why people get Alzheimer's and why there's such a growth in that um, diagnosis. And essentially, think about your brain as a washing machine, Okay, so when we get sufficient sleep, so seven hours plus, our brain uh, flushes out these waste proteins. Uh, there's a waste protein they call beta amyloids. I'll ask you later if you remember that. Um, and essentially, they have linked that protein to, um, to people that will get an Alzheimer's diagnosis. So this is really um, a very important area of research, basically saying, look, there's a link between sleep and something like this. Very, very powerful. Um, and if we don't sleep, we, we feel more helpless and alone, which is uh, a sentiment that you sometimes hear um, in healthcare facilities, right? Particularly long-term care. Wait, guys, there's more. Um, so, so sleep deprivation has been linked to a lot of chronic conditions. You remember I said chronic conditions are driving our healthcare costs up? Um, things like obesity, right? Uh, uh, hormone secretion, uh, appet you know, appetite hormones like leptin and ghrelin diabetes, hypertension, mood disorders. This is why we're irritable to all our friends. Immunity, think about that, right, for healthcare. Increased susceptibility to infection. Uh, Self-medication, this is why we drink so much, guys. We just want to take a nap. Um, and, and, you know, this one um, at the bottom is really sobering. If we sleep five hours or less at night, it increases our mortality by 15%. This is not alertness. This is just really based on chronic conditions. So sleep, but don't sleep right now. That's really my, my takeaway. 
what, what is so interesting, so many of you know this if you study the light world, we're learning more about the links between light and health and sleep-wake cycles. Um, everybody knows about our rods and cones photoreceptors? Does everybody know? Which one are we using now? This is kind of a trick question. Yeah, I know. Gosh, this is a tough question. All right, so day vision, we're typically using our cones. Night vision, we're typically using our rods or something sort of in between. But what we found in the lighting world is in about 2001, we found a third photoreceptor, right? So like lighting people were just like, you know, rioting. I don't know what happened, but it was very exciting. So there's a third photoreceptor and it rolls off your tongue, uh, intrinsically photosensitive retinal ganglion cell. It's a certain type of ganglion cell, IPRGC. That's, that's how you can talk to your friends about it. And essentially, if the rods and cones are really driving our visual system, the IPRGC is driving our biological system. It's really sort of uh, looking for this blue sky. Um, and that's really what's driving completely separate systems in our visual system. So, so think about that. So that third photoreceptor, so again, here's your friend B lambda. B lambda is what the lumen is calculated based on. It's really thinking about photopic vision, which is our cones and how we see. And essentially what our circadian systems are looking for is something in this blue. So when we get light, it's, it's, it speaks to a portion of our brain called the SCN, and that's what helps um, regulate these hormones that drive a lot of different functions, most notably sleep-wake cycles. Um, this study and science that has been underway for many years, lots of great universities, Thomas Jefferson in, in uh, Philadelphia, uh, Light and Research Center at Rensselaer up in Troy, New York. They've, they've done a lot of great work. Um, we're starting to see this moving into applications, right? So circadian rhythms drive a lot of our different functions, um, and there are a lot of new alliances that are really thinking about, okay, how do we commercialize some of this in a, in a very uh, responsible way? So we need to be thinking about internally, how do we create lighting schemes what we're used to naturally? So more to come like that. And if we're thinking about regulating circadian rhythms, you would probably sort of do the scheme that feels more natural, right? So raising the intensity of the light, you may have cooler portions, short wavelength portions of the spectrum, and then as you get into the evening hours and night, you may dim that down, and ultimately we need to design for off, right? Um, and, and that's really what kind of keeps us on, on, on the pace. So, all right, so that's light and sleep. What about light, sleep, and appetite? Any, anybody use this word in a sentence in the last week? Hangry? It is so part of my repertoire. Hangry. Yes, hangry. Karen, define hangry. Yes, you're hungry, and it makes you irritable, and you're mean to all your friends, hence you're hangry. But it's not, it's not gratuitous. I, it's the way that I remember these hormone names, right? So yes, there's a lot. So we know that hunger has a circadian rhythm. That makes sense. Most of us, I'm not calling any names, who knows? Andrew, you're probably one of those guys. You may wake up in the middle of the night starving. Most of us probably don't, right? You're hungrier during the day, not hungry at night. We know that if we don't sleep, we get hungrier. There's a hypothesis that if we don't sleep, many of us are sleep deprived. Can light help offset that effect? Lighting Research uh, 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 Center did a really good study on this, and that's what I want to share. The reason that we've got this hangry here is that when we are hungry, a hormone called ghrelin, so get it, ger, hangry, spikes. Okay, that's our hunger hormone. When we are full, we have a, a hormone called leptin that raises. Okay, so so can light help help uh, help regulate these if they're out of whack? So this is a study. I'm not going to go through all of this, but essentially what they did is they subjected uh, subjects to three different colors of light: uh, red, blue, and green, and. Um, they tested, and, and the fourth condition was they basically put people that were hungry and sleep deprived in darkness. So that was awesome. Some people pulled the, the short stick here. So these were the four light conditions. What they found is that when they made subjects maintain a five hour sleep cycle, the subjects that had the red, green, or blue light, they had higher levels of the hormone leptin, which is the one that tells us that we're full. And they have uh, lower levels for the red and the green of the ghrelin hormone. Right? So this is very interesting because if you remember my earlier slide about linkages to glucose processing, um, hormone secretion, obesity, there's a hypothesis that light might be able to help. So again, linking this light and health. So, enlisting all of our senses. This is not where I'm going to use sparkle, by the way. Just wait for it. Um, so, yep. 
There is no sixth sense here on this slide. I did see the movie, so but I'm not going to talk about that. One of the things that's really <laughs> very um, interesting here is um, this movement to a multi-sensory approach. Um, there's so much uh, good stuff that's coming out of this, and I just really want to expose you to some of the some of the research, right? So, so when we think about lighting, we obviously think about this one, right? Oh, not smell. Oh, let's don't smell like lavender. Let's see, uh, sight, right? Um, but, but really, we think that light and different aspects of light can help inform more of these other senses. So, just just as a thought starter, right? There's there's more research coming out of this. So when we think about hearing, we know that, who said that uh, noise is the biggest uh, environmental stressor in the hospital? Co a couple of you did, right? We know that dimming lights at night and doing, uh, during quiet times at hospitals can help modulate noise levels and it can make patients sleep better, right? Because there's less ambient noise, right? It's just a visual cue. Lower light levels, people don't talk as loud, so that's kind of interesting. Um, we know that the right kinds of light, so maybe framing the door, for example, there's some great studies out of the LRC, can help people be more balanced when they get out of bed, think about long-term care and falls, okay? Um, we know that, so this is a, the sexy word, thermoreceptive. We know that, I'm reading this book called Touch, it's a, a neuroscientist, and they did studies that basically said, if I gave you a hot cup of coffee, versus somebody else giving uh, you a cold cup of coffee. And then you ask me about, uh, if you ask that person about their impressions about the person that handed them the coffee, they feel like the people that handed the warm cup of coffee are warmer spirited, warmer nature, and they feel like the people that handed them the iced coffee are more aloof. There is a, a growing uh, body of research about tactile responses, touch, our perceptions of it and how it impacts the brain. So it's really, really interesting. So if, for example, you were in a setting like, say, chemotherapy, right? People feel cold. Um, people feel, um, in some of these spaces feel institutional. What if you welcome them in with a warmer color temperature of light, potentially? Would that maybe help trigger this thermoreceptive system? It's something that people are exploring. Um, pain response, we know that certain types of light can inhibit pain response. And then multisensory environment. Um, people that don't communicate well verbally, people with autism and other spectrum disorders, um, these areas where they can play with color and sound and music, um, those, those have been therapeutic in many cases. What about positive distraction and mood? Voltaire, art of medicine consists of amusing the patient while nature cure, cures the disease. Send them outside, what Voltaire said, just put them outside, it's gonna be awesome. Not quite. We all have this sort of love of the outdoors. When we think about spaces that we gravitate to, we're always looking at nature. Uh, the biophilia hypothesis, they call it. I'm reading this other book where the author mentions uh, <clears throat> nature deficit disorder. How many of us feel like we have that on a daily basis? So these spaces feel more restorative to us. Um, and, 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 there, and this is actually um, a project that's uh, uh, Queen Long's, uh, Queen's Long Island uh, Renal Institute, right? So, so in center hemodialysis, where um, they're bringing in more natural elements here, bringing in um, clouds to really make it feel more biophilic. Um, when we think about dialysis, that was the image that I just showed. In did everybody bring this? The lighting handbook. Anybody part of the IS? Cover to cover. You who brought it? <laughs> right? It's a hands book. This is them being ironic, right? You could, you could beat somebody up with this. We don't talk about the restorative elements. We talk about foot candles, average maintained foot candles on tap. So can we do more? Um, chemo infusion. I know this is a very common scene in the city, right? Where you have just fields that you can just have people <laughs> stare out at. Um, but essentially that's what they do. They're like, Shh, don't kill the lily. Very indirect lighting, face them outside. Um, Here's a, uh, this is for cancer radiation. This is a linear accelerator where they've got graphic luminaires. Um, MRI setting where, you know, certainly they're using a similar uh, setup here. Ceiling art is called for in the 10th edition. One of the things that I like about this is, a lot of times I'll show ceiling scenes and people are like, really, is that a thing? It used to be very fluffy. Does it work, does it not work? There's a lot of good research that's going on now that basically hooks people up to 
fMRI, so functional MRI, and basically what they've shown is that when people see positive images, their brain waves move away from pain centers and towards pleasure centers. That's really interesting. That's an outcome that really matters to health facilities. Can we do more with that? Deeper connections to nature, Spalding Rehab in Boston. I know you guys always have projects like this where you have a clear story window and you've got the harbor. I think this is just more of the same, right? We, we, we're connected to this. Biophilic design, this is a, on the other side of the spectrum, a primary care clinic, zero budget, but they brought in natural elements. Can we use organic forms, right? This is an OLED. This is not a hospital room. I just blew your mind there. But can we break away from the grid? Can we play a little bit more with form and movement? Um, we may be able to do that going forward. Can we use gentle curves? Sparkle. Here it is. I didn't warn you. Right? So look at this. This is a kind of a waiting room area where you've got a lot of fenestration. You've got a little bit of interest in the ceiling. Waiting rooms are very important for healthcare facilities. If you have a bad experience in the waiting room, it colors the rest of your um, perception of your, or your, of your stay or your, or your uh, episode of care. And so studies have found that if you have a, a waiting space that's well designed, people will judge that they've waited a shorter time. Right? So that's kind of interesting. Also, if you have a view to the outdoors, they'll do the same thing. Color. Right? So, so, so a lot of different things. Can we use color more in the, in the healthcare environment? We certainly do for children's, you know, pediatric healthcare, but can we do more of that? Um, we know uh, color studies are usually very inconclusive, right? Subjective. But one of the things that we know is that white walls, bright white light, very, very institutional. So here's a, a architectural mock-up at Clemson University. Does anybody know a Miami Vice reference, if I make that reference? I'm looking at you really badly because I don't know because then that means I'm really old. But yeah, very past Easter or Passover or springtime, right? This is the springtime scene here. Um, but, but using kind of color to, for the patients to express themselves. That's kind of what this space is. So if I really wanted to do this in a typical healthcare setting, I couldn't do it, right? Because I get, I get a pillow switch with two buttons, right? I can't do anything with that. I can't give you sexy scenes with that. Um, but one of the things that we're seeing um, starting off in children's hospitals, and I hope it makes it into adult care, are tethered apps, right? The app, this is a, the accusation of sort of controls. Like, how do we bring some of that into the space so that we can have more control over the built environment? What about color without colorization? So if I had, you know, a col you know, a pink tint here, and a caregiver came in and said I look flush, that's probably a bad thing. Uh, the great thing is that LEDs are getting so small that we can decouple what's happening when you view it versus the light that gets emanated into the space. Um, we saw a lot of examples of that at, at last year's light fair. So, okay. So what if we really, this is my kid, I'm just kidding. I just want to take credit for that. Uh, so what if we make lighting a little bit, uh, what if we go harder, right? So I, I've shown you some things that you're like, yeah, you know, I've seen, I've seen controls, I've seen color. What else can we do? Okay, so what if we really challenge ourselves? Um, I think we should steal uh, shamelessly from other industries, right? So, so, so retail, right? So, 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 um, Vern, Vern Nagel came up and talked about uh, positional tracking, right? I can find my my toothpaste or my quinoa within centimeters. I'm vegan, so I have to use a quinoa reference. Right? I can find it, okay? I can use my iPhone and it, and it will take me to where my quinoa is. Why can't we do that in healthcare? Anybody try to navigate through a healthcare facility to visit somebody, or even a, even a, a, a medical office building, was it awesome? Because they Frankenstein together so many different buildings because the growth is there, but it's not easy to get around. So what if I use this type of thing, real-time positioning, location, um, to help improve that experience? It's possible, it's not that, that far away. Um, so, so just like with, you know, back in the day, like this is really back in the day, um, we have beacons, we can do that now with light, where the light is the beacon, right? The light is the beacon and a cell phone app can take you where you wanna go. What could you do with that? So, so, so I think that's really kind of uh, one of the next frontiers. There's so many different things that you can do um, with technology, and I'm really just scratching the surface 
a lot of times we do these projects and we want all the beauty and the grace and the cohesive systems and projects that work together, smart, simple, easy to use. Um, what we usually get is something like this. <laughs> Other than, you know, they're, these aren't that different, right? They're leotards and but I don't know if this is the leotard. Don't, if you were an ex-wrestler in college, you'd not come up to me and say, this is not a leotard. They're probably very similar. But, but what, what, what ends up really happening <laughs> is there's a lot more brute force to sort of create the grace and the beauty and the function that we typically want. I think going forward, if we look at the, I just want you to leave you just one more second on this image. <laughs> I think when we look at the future, it will be able to sort of, you know, marry together that form and function better. It'll be more graceful. It'll be more cohesive. Um, it'll just work together like we see with our very smart devices like iPhones and things like that. So technology is going to stop being a constraint. It has been for so long we have, we're used to it, right? Um, it's going to be e integrated. It's going to be easier to use. Mainstream innovation. So things like, you know, when we talk about circadian lighting cycles and tunable color and all of that, I automatically think really high price tags. It doesn't have to be that way. These things can go into the mainstream. Connectivity and the internet of things. Does anybody have one of these? Like a Fitbit? A wearable? Yeah. Yay! Okay. So I didn't sleep, I didn't sleep a lot last night. So why wouldn't my Fitbit tell that, that luminaire, shine more light on Karen, right? So it can wake her up. I don't think that's too far away, right? We're starting to deal with really digital smart devices. So just to sum up, you guys have talked, heard me talk way longer than you should. We can design for healthcare, but I think designing for health is gonna be the real breakthrough for us. Um, that's really what's gonna transform our industry and that's what's gonna transform our world. And that is all I have. I know you guys are very excited about that. Any, thank you very much. Yeah, you know, like Google, you have to have a sound light and then because the sudden will get blinded. Yeah, so so what happens is, it was very interesting in the fluorescent world, typically what we would do would be we'd have the surgical boom and then that would shine light on, on the wound and then we'd have supplemental, this, these are my flight attendant fingers, we'd have the, the <laughs> supplemental surgical lighting that are really right. kind of forming that perimeter. And a lot of times, and particularly when it's machine-aided long procedures, a lot of times the lights in the room would be at a lower level. Fluorescent, we used to switch them to a lower level. Um, what you're seeing now is we're seeing a lot more movement to LED where you can dim down um, to very low levels without sort of creating distracting things like flicker that would not flicker that would not be good in a, in a healthcare setting. So I think having control, it depends on the type of uh, procedure. Um, we're seeing more hybrid ORs. Anybody that, probably some of you have worked on some hybrid ORs where in addition to the traditional operating equipment, you see real-time imaging. Um, equipment coming in, so the surgeon is better for outcomes. The surgeon can kind of see where they're making the incisions. They can look at the tissue, make a more precise incision, um, and that's better for outcomes. But they're not necessarily staring at the wound the whole time. Sometimes they're then looking at, at images. So I think being able to vary the intensity so you don't have that eye strain, um, but you have enough light when you need it for the task is really where you're going. Really high color fidelity, right? So good color accuracy, so people can kind of see that. Um, and the multiple point sources of LEDs does kind of help with the shadowing. So, so I think the technology is helping, helping in that regard. Thank you for that question. Anyone? My healthcare guy asked me, but nobody else cares. I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> Five lamps would be white, four or five, and then you'd have one or two that would be green. During these long procedures, um, because of eye strain, things like that, the surgeons would turn off the white light and just work under the green. It's one of those things that either you love it or you hate it. Some people swear by it, some people don't. 
two theories that I have heard and kind of make sense to me, but I haven't seen a lot of evidence around outcomes. One is that, you know, when we were talking about V lambda, I know you guys see this in your sleep, but this is my V lambda kind of dance. Anyway, so this is, this is really, our, our photopic peak is really at a green. Um, so some people say that, and we know this, it's easy for us to work under low levels of green without getting the eye uh, fatigue. The other thing is the idea of spectral opponency. So if you look at green on one side and red on the other, if I stare, this is the gross part of my explanation, if I stare at a, a red surgical field for a long time and I look up, I'm gonna see green after image. So, so you see that as well, where, the, where they want that green light. Um, it, it's preference. So if you liked it with fluorescent, you're probably gonna like it with LED. Um, but there's not, I saw one study about anesthesia, but it was around preference, but I haven't seen any hard evidence that says, okay, surgeons that do this actually are able to perform better procedures and their patients recover faster. I haven't seen that. So, so that's really where that comes from. Not, not super, super common, but you'll see it. Any other? Karen. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for your care.